the question, how much of your yesterday is in your tomorrow? <laughs> That's a, just a practical question. And what I mean by that is, are we building vision out of our present circumstances and things we did yesterday? Are we making those applications to things that we do, to things that we're changing for tomorrow? I, as you listen to me pray, I'm keenly aware that the culture that we live in is so incredibly going uh, downhill in terms of moral fiber and structure. It's, it's becoming soon handy to, uh, if you hold any dear conservative Christian value, and I want to emphasize the word Christian from the scriptures, uh, the very value itself is criminal behavior in the eyes of certain groups in our country. And uh, regardless of the sincerity which what they may be holding their view, they certainly don't have understanding. And it, but it's imperative that we recognize that the, the primary nature of Christianity is that we stand alone. We stand alone. And the question is, can you stand alone? Can your children stand alone? But I'm not just meaning standing alone by some uh, adverse, you know, stubborn, I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand, but really having a vision for what's right and understanding that you're continuing and that which you have as a heritage all the way to eternity. So I'm going to try to be cohesive. There will be times that I'm going to basically tell you um, the materials in the, in the handbook. So I'm going over some of the things that are already written, but I really encourage you to go ahead and read some of these things that are well written and a good reflection. But um, the big picture is a lifetime. I'm going back and forth a little bit here with my dad. Um, he's in hospice care, 94 years old, turning 95 in June. If he makes it, he's not supposed to make it to June, but he's, <laughs> my dad's amazing. Every year he almost dies in December, January, and then he perks back up and that's just fine for another year. So. Uh, we'll see, but he is totally bed, bedridden and um, in hospice care. But um, I just, it's a real pleasure for me. Becky joined our staff after she retired. And you know, I just thought it was a real, real sweet treasure that the Lord would bring somebody well-trained in, in her retirement years. And this is Becky's 35th year with Walkersville. Can you believe that? 35 years of retirement. That's like another career and three quarters of another one. <laughs> so it's such a pleasure. But you know, our lives were meant to be spent in service. I love that picture from Philippians where it says that Jesus took on himself he humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a servant. He took on himself the form of a man. And I find that that's an amazing statement. So the form of man, the way we were designed physically with all of our abilities, we're born to serve. And the greatest joy that we can have is to serve all the way through. Now, when you have my, my wife and I are at a different stage now. Our youngest baby is um, 25, it'll be 25 this, this August. So that's no longer baby. So we've, we're not homeschooling in that direct sense, but by the grace of God, we're enjoying walking with our kids as they're raising their kids and, and uh, watching them march on towards the goal and at the same time by God's grace helping them when we can hopefully we're help <clears throat> but I, I I remember what Jesus said to Peter at the Last Supper he said you know <clears throat> oh, oh Peter was bragging that he would die with Jesus that very day he said well you really you really don't know yourself that well but I Satan has desired you to sift you like wheat but I prayed for you and when you're converted, comfort your brothers. 
And this little clip I have on the screen here from First Peter, he wrote two little epistles, and they're such gentle, comforting epistles, such visionary epistles. Epistles that basically he's saying, you know, I don't have much time left, but every moment I have, I'm going to keep stirring you up to remember those things that are important. Uh, one of the first meetings I had with Becky, I think it was right after our first workshop, uh, we were planning for the second one, and she said, well, now, uh, Mr. Vermont told me something that's important, and that is you need to always repeat the same things because the things that are really important need to be repeated again and again. And so I don't do as good as Becky in terms of repeating the same thing. I say the same thing in different ways. <laughs> but, the, but the point of it is what a, what a, what a privilege. And, uh, you know, if you're raising your kids and you're looking for the, the escape hatch, like, I can't wait till they're 18 and they're out of here. I can have my life back. <laughs> well, that's not a very Christian attitude. <laughs> you need to be there in the transition to the end. So um, that's, that's the goal here. Of course, we see the same thing with the Apostle Paul, his desire. You know, every... What, are, what an, amen, an amazing tug of war we have the privilege of having. Oh, I'd rather leave and be with Jesus. That's far better. <laughs> but it's more needful. It's more useful for me to be here. There's a chance for me to serve a little while longer. And so probably that's what God's going to have me do. <laughs> so <clears throat> while we're going to spend some time today dealing with the applied part of homeschooling with records and what have you. Um, remember, 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 you're a spiritual cheerleader for your children's life, their whole life. And, and it's, you keep learning it, you, you learn more as you go along, learning, I'm hoping I'm learning more today than I did five years ago. And never forget that heaven's the goal. That's always, always the case, heaven's the goal. And yesterday gives us perspective, you know, Somebody, sometimes people ask the question, well, if you had it to do over again, what would you do different? And what does that mean? Well, it means that, uh, do you look back and realize, oh, I didn't quite have my vision functioning as well as I could have. And if I would do something over, hopefully what I would want to do over is have sharper vision, have clear vision to, to the end goal. Now, I'm not going to go through this a psalm. It's, it's it would take the rest of the time and it doesn't need to be but we can read it I'm, I'm just rather astonished with this is called the last prayer of David the prayers of David are finished and he prays for his son it's, king. It's, we're, we're, it's the transition of the new king but he prays for the king to have justice righteousness prosperity <clears throat> to lift up the cause of the poor and as I'm looking through these, I'm thinking, you know, this is the desire of every godly Christian parent. You, you want your kids to be able to impact the world they're going to be living in and taking over with these spiritual qualities for eternal good. And so I really encourage you to read that psalm further. Now, I have a little quiz. <clears throat> it's on page, well, it's, they're not numbered. It's on the next page next to the blank session notes. And it's called um, quiz. So the first question says, the singular hallmark of Western civilization is blank, which is the character quality that enables one to pursue a particular course of action that arises from inward confidence and motivation of the individual and is not dependent upon the community for approval huge thing, probably the practical application of spiritual heritage. Center, center stone. Anybody want to guess? This one? What'd you say? Discipline. Discipline. No, individualism. Individualism. Now, I, I say that because I, I, I love it. I love it when you gather spiritual truth and you realize what it is. The whole purpose of structure and order and being under authority in your life is to give you liberty. It's to release you, to let loose all of those gifts that God has for its greatest purpose 
and longest enduring value. And so individualism is that character quality that we have. And I just want to say briefly about individualism. I'm not talking about selfish, I'm the center of the universe. I'm talking about the centerpiece of character where there's something inside of me that answers back to a reality that stirs up my motivation and enables me to not only seek help and guidance, but also to stick to a course when I'm all alone. The next question, excuse me, the next question, well I guess it's a question anyway, the next blank is, the source of individualism is founded on the blank ethic. This ethic has been the primary source of social morality in Western civilization since the fall of the Roman Empire. Judeo-Christian ethic. Oh, I guess I can just, I can do this and have it come in like that. Oh, isn't that nice? I never do this kind of stuff. <laughs> Judeo-Christian ethic. And it's important that we understand. I remember when I was visiting with uh, Ruth. Ruth's our intern, but I was in China visiting her dad. First time I was there. And he was telling me from personal experience, I hadn't been there that long, that it, it's astounding. You never know what incredible saturation the Judeo-Christian uh, mor moral ethic has in our culture until you go to a culture that has never, ever had it. And he said, it's unbelievable because there's absolutely nothing to refer back to. So when we have folks, as it were, um, who are at their most immoral nature in our culture, the foundations of morality are so steep still in those people that our society is still functioning significantly off of that Judeo-Christian ethic. Next one, God appoints authorities. We listen very carefully, this is, this is tracking hard. God appoints authorities, we obey God's appointed authorities because we first obey God. We must always obey rather than man. God. That's right. We must always obey God rather than man. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother. Now, this is the bedrock of individuality. I don't belong to another human, I belong to God. I belong. I'm bought with a price, as a believer especially. But I belong, but I don't belong to another human. And so in the construct of life, we, are, we have a role as parents that's limited over the individual. It doesn't continue on. It's that, now the, the easiest quick release mechanism that you can emotionally process is when your kid gets married. And that, now it's a new sacred domain. And parents are banned from governing that new couple and they're directly under God, and God is governing that couple and will hold them accountable. But you won't miss the, the secret of Western Civ's, the value of individual in Western civilization, if you understand that the individual must always be free to obey God. And that is, that is the bedrock value of our culture. That's where all human rights come from. That's where all liberty springs from. Next one is in the, in its simplest form, the Judeo-Christian ethic understands that God is, God rewards, and God speaks by his word, his word which is revelation. God speaks by his word, which is revelation, <clears throat> which is authoritative and supreme law. There's no higher authority than God's law. And our culture, as you remember, we clarified it in our country. It's lex rex not Rex Lex. And I love it when a little Latin acronym like that can be so simple and so substantive. Lex, the law, Rex is king. Not the king is law. And of course, up until our country was founded, there was a paralyzing uh, overlording of kingdoms with kings. And uh, there aren't many kingdoms left due to the huge positive impact of that moral foundation of individualism that says, no, your honor, I defy you. I know you can throw me and cast me into the lions. I know you can throw me in the fiery furnace, but God's able to deliver me from you. 
And if he chooses not to, still, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bow down to you. I'm going to bow down to God only. And that's the foundation of individualism, where I so respect God, I so revere him as my Lord, as my God, as my Savior. And I'm sold out totally to him. My whole life is filled with anticipatory expectation. Who is the Lord and what is he doing? Continuing on, the next little question is, Obedience to God is the final arbitrator between society and the individual. What is the individual's judgment of right and wrong before God? You could just spit him out if you want to. Conscience is the individual's judgment of right and wrong before God. Now this is, this is huge. If I'm supposed to obey God in all things, then what I have is, I'm sorry, I got the authoritative law there, and the next one is conscience. <clears throat> I have my conscience to arbitrate with society. Now, we have to learn some manners in arbitrating with society. A little anecdotal story. When we first started our program, and the State Department was telling us we couldn't do this. The Department of State had the nerve, <laughs> Board of Education, the guy had the nerve to ask me, well, don't you believe in Romans 13? You're supposed to obey the authorities. I mean, literally, I've had, I, I could not believe holding me accountable to Scripture. And there, the last thing the guy looked like was somebody who really loved Scripture. But he used it for his advantage. And I said, well, uh, there is a limit to your authority. And I'll tell it to you this way. Uh, if you want to overlord babies, then you go have your own kids. Society can have their own kids. But God gave these kids to me, and I have that first responsibility. And you have no authority over them that doesn't also include my direct authority under God. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. At that moment, I was getting hot. And so I was getting hot e hotty. <laughs> and I was kind of getting snarly and unpleasant. And God dealt with me on that. And I, I had to go back to the person. I, went, I did that on the phone, but I went in person to apologize for my, for my generally disrespectful attitude. And I apologize for my disrespectful attitude, but not for my conscience issue. And, and it was helpful that I did. But the reality is my conscience is what I arbitrate with, with, with men. And that's the beautiful thing. If, if your conscience before God convicts you to do X, Y, Z, then the government is only going to be able to take your life or punish you or do some punitive thing. And that's why I call it arbitrator. And so for the believer, if we really have true conscience towards God, if we really have true conscience for God before God as believers, then we can enter into a negotiation with someone else. Then we can do like Daniel did and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then we can say, well, we have a little problem here. Um, we really want to honor God in the food we eat. And it's really a, a, a defilement of us. Is it possible for, that you could accommodate our sincerely held religious belief. And the guy was like, You're, you understand, my head's going to literally roll if I let you guys have a special diet and you're not as good as everybody else in terms of how you're faring. And so they came up with a little plan. And they basically said, well, uh, we believe we'll be as good or better than everybody else. Why don't you do a trial run? I forget what it was, 10 days or something. Try us out. At the end of the trial period, they were better than all the others and wiser, and God blessed them. But that is such a, 
you, you, you don't have to understand. I, I, I said in the opening statement, since the Roman Empire, but really, since the Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians, uh, that's been the hallmark of true Christian faith. My conscience before God is the means by which we impact society around us because we live for God. But it means you have to stand with a sincere conscience, you have to stand with a clear conscience, with a respectful conscience, and you have to negotiate some of these processes. Well, how can I do what I can do without violating my conscience and what I can't do? Next one. <clears throat> Man's conscience is the ultimate blank court in any society. Anybody want to shout it out? Appeals court. In this life, conscience isn't measured by what one gains from obedience, so much measured by what one is willing to lose to preserve obedience to God, whom do you ultimately fear? And that's really getting back to this whole power of individualism. My individualism is best expressed when I'm willing to lose everything, including my life, to hold fast to my obedience to God. And that's the final appeals court. And, you know, I like the way that I, I, it, the quote was earlier on the other slide, but I like the way it was said by Peter before the court. Well, you can figure out what it means. Are we, are we be, obey God rather than man? Should we obey God or man? It's an easy point of reference. And the next one is, an individual fears God above all over all their authorities, no matter how fearful they may be, mutes the voice of tyranny and gives birth to true liberty. It's really an interesting thing. <laughs> How many of you have watched the movie It's a Bug's Life or A Bug's Life? Yeah, at my stage, I'm watching those kind of movies again. Because <laughs> that's what the grandkids are watching. Again and again and again. <laughs> but the interesting thing about It's a Bug's Life is simply this. Tyranny is somebody holding you in fear and liberty is holding to your own conscience and not being afraid, standing up. And there's, I mean, I don't want to go too far with Bug's Life having a lot of high moral values in it, necessarily. But, um, but that's, that's how you do it. And it's what you, now, and, and children, if, here's a little measuring tool, or mom and dad for a kid. If I'm trying to get what I want, and my rebellion is stubbornness to get what I want, then that thing that I want being temporal really indicates that I, I'm not answering to the God of the universe that I'm trusting and I'm just trying to get what I want. But when I must please God and, I, and I'm willing to take, not, I'm not going to get something, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it. <laughs> I'm going to get some kind of punishment, and I'm willing to, to please God, that really puts an end to tyranny. Now, I'm just going to say really briefly, one of the things that would really be great for your kids in social studies and they're uh, along the way, it would really be helpful for you to do a chronology of Christians who suffered for their faith and died, the story of martyrs, not only just up you know, through the Roman Empire time frame, but beyond people who stood because what's happened is this overthrowing of tyranny never happened in a generation. It never happened in a generation. It was built over time upon conscience and the weight of conscience. And our country was founded 400 years ago. The pilgrims came to this land and it was simply for conscience sake that so they could practice their religion before God, not be meddled with by the government, that they came here. That was a long, treacherous time if you just followed the path of the pilgrims and what they suffered and lost in the process of just trying to have a place to worship God according to conscience. And that's the heritage that we have as people. And lastly, it's the blood of martyrdom that's the seed of the church. In other words, yes, there are times when you will have to lay down your life. That's the whole nature of the Christian life. What are you, you going to lay your life down so that you can follow Christ? 
so that you can follow the cross. This is hugely important. If you have a child who has godly individualism, their outlook is going to be one of embracing God's authority, one of seeking out God's opportunities, and you're going to be able to be a model of, as an example of someone who follows God, and you're going to be able to be a counselor to your children along the path. You know, I, I wish I could wave a magic wand and have this happen, but if, if a child could suddenly understand that they're resisting the wrong thing, and if they could learn to resist the devil instead of resisting God's established authority, isn't it interesting? Resist. We have a, this instinctive nature of resisting, but if you resist Satan, then you're going to embrace the order of God in your life, and you're going to become an individual, and you're going to be released, and you have no idea what trail you're going to go down as you humbly obey God. But that's the backbone. And any child who learns to resist the devil and embrace the authority of God, to look with authority with a vision and say, this is what God has for me. To look at a responsibility and to look at authority and say, this is a resource for me to help my, get, me get my responsibility done. I want to receive everything that I can get from the Lord. What an incredible vision. I've got a God in heaven who loves me. He orders every step to the universe. This is Roe v. Wade week. Yesterday was the March for Life. And uh, I think Tuesday, the 22nd, or whatever that was, that was the actual anniversary, 47th anniversary. And read Psalm 139 in, in light of understanding the value of life and what God says. I mean, the psalmist says, uh, the thoughts that you think towards me are so many, I couldn't render them back in order. He orders, before I was ever born, he had it all planned out. Do you believe in that kind of a sovereign God? Because only belief in that kind of a sovereign God allows you to embrace him. You can embrace him in every difficult circumstance because you know he's sovereign. And in embracing his sovereignty in that circumstance, you can immediately have hope. I wonder what God's going to do with this. This is amazing. What's God's plan here? Because he's in charge. Because he has the final say. I know Job's a long book to read. It's wearisome. But the book of Job is such an incredible story because it starts out with God's perspective. I've got this righteous man. Nothing. There's no one like him on the whole earth. And for his sovereign choice, he determined that I'm going to demonstrate his righteousness through the hardships I allow him to have. Now, when Job's in the middle of the hardships, he ends up saying a few things that are regretful. At least he repents and covers his mouth. But Job wished that he had never been born. That's a pretty strong statement. You're in a lot of pain when that's what you wish. And when God finally, and he starts asking God, why? Why, why, why am I getting the shaft? I mean, I've served you. And it was, you know, you the reader know it's true because God said so at the beginning. <laughs> I've served you faithfully. And this is what you're doing to me? What, what, what gives? I'd like to have a little counsel here. And then God just teaches a science lesson. Isn't that amazing? Teach a science lesson and learn about the sovereignty of God and you shut up and you worship and you repent. How about if your science lessons ended like that? With repentance <laughs> because of the greatness of God. But that's, that's why we study science. To recognize just how incredibly fearfully and wonderfully we're made and our soul knows it right well and we can trust in God. Where can I flee from thy spirit? I can't go anywhere. He's always there. So I trust. So I embrace. And so I seek. And we have to have each other. We have to have community. We have to have communion. Kids need their parents. Parents need the community of the church. Because we all go through really tough times. And if Job, the, right, the most righteous man on the earth of his time, could be led to despair, you and I can be led to despair. So it's not the fact that we don't have a 
heavy, difficult process, it's the fact that we go through that process victoriously, embracing the circumstance, embracing the difficulty, and resisting the devil. And the natural human instinct is what? It's to resist the circumstance, to embrace our comfort. And that's the devil. We're embracing the devil. I mean, really think of it. Excuse me just a second, God. I need some counsel here. Hey, devil, what do you think about this? This looks pretty bad to me. What kind of counsel do you think you're going to get? Reasonable? Helpful? Eternally valuable counsel? Not. <clears throat> so, now, at the next page, I, I wrote this month's article. And I wrote it upon reflection. If you read last month's article, it was a kind of get advanced... Uh, the thoughts I thought before we went down to visit my dad, and this is thoughts I wrote after we visited him. It was such a blessing. Um, five of my kids, 31 of my grandkids, all came down to North Carolina and visited my dad over an eight-day period and uh, multiple visits. It was just really, really sweet. And probably the most um, uh, encouraging comment I've ever heard from my dad came at the end of it as I'm getting ready to leave. And he's, he's just so amazed that my kids would take that kind of time and effort. And because they're you know, bringing all the kids. And listen, this is just, you're getting to visit them only like an hour and a half. And we, close as we could stay was like two hours, a two hour drive. So it's all over. He just, he said, you know, the kids put a lot of effort to come in to see me. He said, you know, it, it speaks well of you because the only thing they know about me is what you've told them. And the way they treat me, they, they love me more than any other grandkid. And that's the testimony. That's it's been my hope and my joy and my desire, but he said it with his own mouth. <laughs> it, was, it was impactful. But um, when I got back, I wrote this article. I, I had to do it as a, a spiritual exercise, just to, you know, let it go and get unwind and get focused and go on. <clears throat> but um, as I touch on a few things here, um, you know, I was a child that was affected by my dad's faith. I, fe I, I discovered my dad's faith looking at his prayer book, secret, secret prayer book, and I want to underline the word secret, literally. And as you know, the background I have is different from what I am today. And, but I, I saw, I, in reading your dad's secret prayer book, I saw a sincere love for God, a, a sincere passion for God. And I just wanted to be like him. From that hour, it birthed in me this unwavering desire to know the Lord, to serve him, to follow him. Now, I didn't, I didn't have that satisfied until I was 20. And... When I was 20, I got born again by the grace of God in a Baptist church, and that didn't go over real well. <laughs> My dad had been a Baptist once upon a time. But, um, you know, as, I, as you read the story that I have in there, um, we did a lot of things as a family, religious things that were really intended to stir up childish understanding, childish devotion. We had a little Jesus and I club, <clears throat> and it was, it was an incredible positive form for our family, but it wasn't a personal relationship. And I, and I recognize that the best you can do in your home is present a form of godliness to your kids. That's the best you can do. Nothing, let's say that you uh, have family devotions together every day. It never fails. Let's say you pray at bedtime every day. It never fails. Let's say that you go to church. Every time the doors open, you know, list them all out. The things that, the, the, the things that you do for piety's sake because you love God. And your kids participate with you. Everything that you do out of the genuineness of your faith, your kids are doing they're going through the motions, they're going through your form. And if all you leave your child with is the form of your religion, then they don't have enough. 
They need to have that personal relationship with God. And, you know, getting back to that earlier lecture I had a minute ago, you know, the structural reality of life is this. I have to love God with all my heart. Well, how does that happen? Well, the Bible tells me it happens because the Holy Spirit sheds that love abroad in my heart. And I didn't, I didn't have that happen until I was 20. I was born again and I was the filling of the Holy Spirit, filling me with the love of God, absolutely, genuinely transformational. And my love for God was the springboard from which I immediately determined I'm going to serve Him my whole life. I'm not going to go to the right level. I'm going to serve God no matter what. But the power, the strength of my devotion and love for God came from His love for me that satisfied me. And so, <laughs> your children must personally be born again. They must personally experience the love of God. And how does God reach our children? Over the years, the, the history of the church shows me that we've tried all kinds of things, but everything we've tried has resulted only in one thing, a form of godliness. And you still need to be born again. Still got to have that individual transformational entrance of the Holy Spirit. And while this wasn't the intention of it, I'll just give two quick verses. Romans 5 talks about the Holy Spirit being shed abroad in our hearts. Romans 8 talks about the fact that if you don't have the Spirit of God, you're not a Christian. It's that simple. And I, I, I recognize that our experiences with God and our experiences with the Holy Spirit might be varied and sundry once we get born again, but that entrance of the Holy Spirit, that down payment, that thing, the down payment thing where I know that I know that I know that I'm His, that's the presence of the Holy Spirit, and that's what your child needs. So, never ever cease to be sensitive to that fact, and the spiritual battle in your home is always going to be, Satan is going to be getting your children to resist God, so they're going to be resisting you because you're His legal authority. You're His representative spiritual authority. And Satan's going to want to continually paint you in a bad light. Now the problem is sometimes <sighs> there's no way but to see us in a bad light. You know, when we get all bad, Satan! <laughs> and we become the terror of the minute. I know you've never done that. Just some people like me. But, but spiritually speaking, there's that battle. And we've got to, we've got to invite God into our life and push Satan out. Resist the devil and he'll free, flee from you. Um, <clears throat> I've already said all that. So here's the, here's the wonderful thing about Satan. Look at the passages in the scripture that give you and I warning about Satan. He's out there. And we're to be sober and be vigilant because he's like a roaring lion seeking to define devour, see who he can devour. But never, ever think about what Satan does? This is really simple. He only ever has negative thoughts. He only ever finds fault. He only ever complains. That's all he does. And that's how he can get you to resist God. Well, a lot of good that did me. I'm not going to do that again. I, I mean, I've, I hear adults say that. I can't believe that God would expect anybody to live in such misery as I'm in. So, so I'm going to change the laws of God, right? Yeah, let's go ahead and resist God and embrace that wise counsel of the devil, which is just criticism. But the so amazing thing about Satan's criticism, he, he succeeded with Adam and Eve in criticizing God to them. And they had nothing but absolute, incredible experience of his lavish luxury and love. And they fell for it. So, if Adam and Eve in a perfect environment falls for it, how much more is the battle on for us? When the, when the battle, the environment's not so positive, and 
our presentation always is filtered through our sin. <clears throat> so, uh, I, I love it. Do, do you guys ever look at the calendar, the Walkersville calendar anymore? I mean, do you look at the sayings on it? Do you ever look at it? Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. So, so this month's saying from Becky, just really simple. You know, uh, relax, back up, get the big picture. You have a privilege of taking your child in their momentary need, however it's being expressed, and leading them to Jesus in light of that need. And relax. It's the child that needs help. It's the child that needs to be recovered. And so embrace that. Embrace that, embrace that privilege. I mean, it's, it's really still the continually single largest reason why parents ought to homeschool. Because you just need to have your kids present or walk with them down the spiritual channel. <clears throat> so I had this little thought this morning about school. So like, when you just send your kids to school and you say, oh, that's taken care of, what, what happens is you think that that education is the most important thing of their, child, of their childhood years. And so you relax and you rest and say, okay, well, we can just have fun the rest of the time. But it's such a, such a false paradigm. And when you put your kid into school, by the way, that's primarily the only thing they have in mind. Well, we've got to get these subjects into your kid's numb skull, one way or another. No matter how many nabl, names we label them with, because they're not learning our way. But that picture of the school is never going to take nurturing seriously. Never. And I, I know you guys have heard the story a thousand times, but I'll say it one more because maybe one person never heard it and it'd be worth it. I'm a brand new teacher. I'm 22 years old. That's kind of young, so my principal told me never to admit it to the kids how young I was. There was an 18-year-old in my class. <laughs> and I'm just a brand new daddy. I have a four-week-old son. And I'm standing before your kids in my class, and I'm looking at them, and I had this vision, I really want to teach them for Jesus, I really want to do this good for God. And I couldn't get my son off my heart. I realized, I'm thinking of my son. 24 hours, I, I, these kids, you know, I think of them when they're in front of me, but they're like a mirror, you remove them and they're gone, you know. Forget about them. And I realized, as a Christian school, Christian teacher, who wanted to teach for God that I lacked the kind of love that God intended for a child to have in a nurturing home for those years. I learned that, teaching your kids. And it wasn't that I was a bad teacher or a teacher that didn't love. I just had never had such love in my heart. And so the gift of parental love that we have, we don't need to let it go out, we need to nurture it. We need to take advantage of it. We need to realize that no one else on earth will care for your child like God has appointed you to, and you can. And by his grace, you will. <clears throat> Refined Christian culture raises pleasant individuals, but it will never save them. I was reading a life story of Theodore Roosevelt one time, and he was describing his culture, and he was talking about this whole concept of becoming converted, being born again. And he said, you know, the problem with our culture is everything is Christian. We're all Christians, and there's such a refined nature to it that actually the whole process of becoming born again isn't something we even think about. It's just kind of presumed and assumed. And it was an astonishing thing, but you don't want a refined Christian culture. So here's what refined Christian culture looks like, okay? Genesis 3. God said, okay, they couldn't take the garden. It was neat, organized, lush, lavish. Their only work was arranging the flower pots. Oh, this looks better this way. Oh, oh look, a little birdie. Oh, how are you doing? 
do you like this, this flower? Oh, you don't like that one? Do you like this one? It was a really hard life. And Satan convinced them that they were being robbed of even greater happiness, greater joy. And so they sinned. And so God said, fine, out of the garden you go. And we're going to plant some thorns and thistles. And, you know, we're going to, like, reduce the capacity of the soil to produce food and make things harder. And we're going to give you a few more kids, too. You know, give you a few more mouths to feed. I think about that. It's one of the first things I thought of as a new Christian. Think about that. God has wisely, divinely appointed hardship as the theater that teaches us to call on his name. Now, if you take Genesis 3 all by itself, I've had people argue with me and said I was telling a lie. So I'm going to go to Romans 8 and get my defense. And in Romans 8, it talks about the curse. The world was subject to vanity. That means emptiness, frustration. It means the curse. The world was subject to the curse. Actually, it doesn't say the world, I'm sorry. It says the creature. That's me. I'm the creature. We're subject to vanity, not willingly. Wasn't my plan. Wasn't my idea. I never get up in the morning and say, Lord, um, I think today it would be really great if I had three pounds of, dis of negative discussion with my daughter, uh, a half a pound of frustration from my wife, and, um, and at work give me seven pounds of really, really bitter moments with my boss. I think that'll work today. Okay, see you, God. How many of you wake up and do that? No, we don't willingly do that. We wake up and we say, Lord, please help me today with that boss of mine. <laughs> and, that, and, and it says not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected it to hope. And here's the thing. You perfectionist little homeschool parents, listen to me. Here's the problem. You think that if you could get everything fixed and organized, oh, if we could just get right at 7 o'clock, bing, everybody wakes up with a smile on their face and they're already dressed and they come down to have devotions. Good morning, Daddy. Good morning, Mommy. How are you today? And you sit down in your seat and you read your Bible and you have such a wonderful day. That, that's what we're striving for, right? To get the there. And we just get so frustrated. But here's the problem. You and I are so vain. We would just like to have a little fun today. And we don't have to worry about tomorrow. And we would skip altogether. We would miss heaven entirely. If you could be the best parent that you could on your own power today, you'd never go to heaven. Because you'd be fully satisfied with what you're getting done now. You'd be happy to have your family on the showcase cover of Time Magazine best homeschool family of the year. All of my kids have their triple doctorates. You got it? God is, God's pretty intentional about frustration. And what he wants to do with frustration is very simple. He wants to teach you to call on his name. He wants to teach you to call on his name. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this process of being saved is a process of life. And that's where we meet God. Because every moment of our life, there's a new little thing we need. How do we get God in the eternal perspective in the midst of today's momentary circumstance? How do we do that? Well, you won't do it in the thrills of the momentary circumstance. But you will do it when you have difficulty and you have to endure hardship and you have to have a vision for that enduring hardship. And we have Jesus as the model. We look at him, who for the glory set before him. What glory? Well, you'll find out when we get to heaven. There's nothing to be compared with that glory. Who for the glory set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he set back on the, son of, on the right hand of the Son of God. Are we ready? I, I marvel at how crafty Satan has been in our culture. 
and agenda items that I thought were absolutely impossible to ever be realized in a public forum. They're now not only realized, they're promoted, and anyone resisting them is a criminal. It's unbelievable. So, how are you going to do it? The only way they do do I have on the bottom of the page here, you've given them a banner to them that fear you, that it may just be displayed because of the truth. You know, we, we have to, the opening verse to this section, I've set the Lord before me, if he's at my right hand, <clears throat> therefore I shall not be shaken. You and I need the equipment to stand in the storm. Not be shaken in the trial. To have a vision above vision. That, that's what's the picture of the banner, banner of truth. No, no, this is true. This is the truth. Walk you in it. And be there. Be there for yourself, first and foremost. Be there for your kids as a testimony. Be there as a faithful witness to your kids. You know, the decision of the moment isn't the big part. What's the big part is understanding the moment for what it really is in light of eternity. And then go for eternity. Go for that which lasts forever. Always make those eternal choices in the moment. <clears throat> Never lose sight of the reality that adherence to external forms will not save anybody. So give up on your dreams of being the best yet. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't strive to walk humbly. We, we don't strive to walk in repentance. We don't strive to uh, humble ourselves to do those things. But here's what happens. When you and I are in a tumble, and we're, go we're going after way too many things, we've got ideals and idealistic goals that are too big to fit in our normal life. And we won't let them go. And so these idealistic dreams and goals come jamming in our life and creating the tense pressure and turmoil. And what do we jettison? Well, we've made this so important. We jettison things that are more ordinary and normal, but don't look like they're that important. But they're the very foundational things of character, where we learn to weather the ride, where we learn to see quickly the eternal picture in the moment that quickly comes upon us. <clears throat> it's about calling on the Lord with all our heart. It's not about us working out to such a perfectionist scheme that we don't need the Lord. I've got this covered, God. You can go and help Mary. She really needs it. <laughs> May God be gracious to us, turn away the captivity that is sweeping our land. It is, un is unbelievable captivity. Can you believe 47 years we've, in our Christian-esque, Judeo-Christian culture, abortion stands still. It stands on the strength of the screaming and hollering vitriol and hatred of Satan's and, and his minions. You know, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to me. Are we called to end abortion in our day? Well, I, I think we're called to live for the truth in our day in such a way that it reaches every resource. Everybody that you touch should experience the light of God and the hope of God. But if you don't have that banner flying, if you don't have that banner flying, it's nothing, it's nothing for anybody to look to. You know, in battle, it's the banner that keeps everybody focused. When the banner falls, terror sweeps across the troops. We cannot remain faithful to God without, to the without blessing of God, giving us the providential grace to endure to the end so we can finish the course. Now, I've asked Becky to come and share. Um, she has a 10-hour message. I've asked her to squeeze it into 10 minutes. Now, yes, uh-huh. But um, I, so I'm putting words in her mouth, but these are the words I got out of her mouth at our annual dinner. Deliver us from evil and it's the simple word about championship. Becky?
What a privilege. What a blessing. We're here together for the same purpose, aren't we? We are looking at the privilege and the opportunity to um, train leaders going out of your home, maybe tomorrow, taking over, and uh, that leadership training that you're doing affects everything in your home. So when you're having breakfast, you're doing leadership training. And when you're having mathematics, you're doing leadership training. And when you're going to bed, you're having leadership training. It's a beautiful picture of the ability of the home to impact for generations to come. And as you're training the leader in your home right now, the beauty of it is you are also training their children and their children and their children. And then as Gary has already said, we by grace trust the work of the Holy Spirit to carry out that which we've trained for eternal fruit. But what I wanted to share with you this morning in particular with regard to training leaders is keep the focus. Now keep that little phrase in mind as we go through these next eight and a half minutes, okay? Keep the focus. What is the focus? Who are you training? You're training young men, young women, to love God the most. The most. Then you're training them next to love others. But not most, but next. You see? And then when we think of equipping these um, children, teenagers, young adults in our home, when we think of equipping them, that's where school comes in. That's why it's such a blessing that you have the opportunity and the privilege to school. Because as parents, you're called to equip anyway for this leadership training. So the school offers you that, that entire privilege of the academics related to that equipping. So that in all things that you're doing, you're learning that leaders are being trained. Now, I want to give you the takeaway for today. I hope we can use maybe one or two illustrations. But when you're thinking of training, let's think of just an everyday opportunity. Let, let's use this opportunity, for example. Let's suppose that much of your homeschooling you do with everyone together. And the students are very often excited to come together to read to each other or for you to read to them, depending on ages. But when you're doing math, very often you're doing it student by student rather than everybody together. Now this might not be true if children are very young or very old, but most of the in-between ages, you're going to be doing math on different levels. So perhaps you sat down with your 11-year-old and started him in his math. And you made sure that he knew what to do and that he understood the assignment. He understood all that was required of him in his 20-minute period or 30-minute period of working. And so you move on to the next student and you set up for that student to be able to do the work that he can do. And finally you get to the youngest students and you work a few minutes with them because they need you the full time of their work. And so the time is up and you come back to your 11 year old and you notice that your 11 year old has done either a problem or two or nothing at all. Now, here is the takeaway for today. We're talking about leadership training, right? The takeaway in that situation is keep the focus. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I am a disciplinarian, so I'm not wanting you to get the wrong idea, but in that particular moment and in every moment like that, your focus must be what is God doing, following substantially from what Gary has already told us. Your focus must be what is God doing here 
and what is God doing now? And so before you would rant with, now, now, now look at this. There is a humanistic way to respond to that situation and there is a gospel Bible way to respond to that situation. Humanism looks at the behavior first. The gospel looks at what is going on in kingdom business first. Do you see? That's why you have to keep the focus. Why do you have to keep the focus? Because you are a humanist. Your very first reaction naturally will always be to look at the behavior. I, I have worked with this over 50 years and in just recent weeks I had opportunity to practice what I'm standing here telling you and failed. Why? Because naturally I'm going to go the route of the humanist. And so what did I do but look at this girl and say, what? What are you thinking? What was I looking at? The behavior. And if I want to win in that situation, remember we're talking about leadership training. If I want to win in that situation, I'm going to have to look at it through the gospel lens of grace. And so what would that look like? Well, it may look absolutely no different, except that I would have first said, Father, help. Or maybe another time I would say, what are you doing, Father, because I'm disgusted. Or another time it might be, Father, I want to take your path, but my own path pulls me so hard. You see, we are being perfectly honest with God, but our focus is right. We're telling him we need him and we're depending on him. So now go back to the 11 year old that we left there doing nothing and what might we do in that particular situation if we wanted to put aside the humanism and embrace gospel training. Well there we, what we might, we do many things and be right. And by the way, you do have the authority as parents to do what you want to do. But hopefully you will grow in wanting to do what is biblical and what is gospel work. But, but this, is, this is what would be a consideration in this case. You might, you might say to the 11 year old, well, we need to find out what was going on in your time. Maybe you spent it more prosperously than I could have thought of. And then if that becomes the case at some later day, at some later hour in the day, you might have time to sit with the child and find out what in the world his brain was doing. And you might concede even to him, but you remain in authority. And so he still does the assigned work that he gave and probably he'd do it at the time everybody else is doing Lego. And that would be one way that that could be dealt with. But you always want this student to know that he does have a voice. <clears throat> now remember, in the situation uh, that I gave, that appeared to be willful disobedience. But we're also talking about accidental disobedience. You see, accidental disobedience has come to be overlooked in the Christian community. It is he couldn't help it. He didn't mean it. And then as we begin to embrace that and allow that to escape training, then more and more misbehavior or disobedience becomes accidental in our analogies of life. And so if we aren't careful, we'll slip all the way down into all of sin is accidental. You know, this wouldn't have happened to her if he had not. You see, it all becomes accidental. And so we want to deal with it in the very same way. Now, as... Uh, as, as we're thinking of how do I get the habit of looking first at the biblical approach. I get the habit of looking at the biblical approach by practicing it. As I practice it, each time I fail, for example, let me use my own example from just a few weeks ago that I just told you about. Do you realize that I had hardly gotten any part of that out of my brain and mouth 
before the Holy Spirit showed to me and spoke to me there's a better way and I could turn around right away in that time. Now it might not happen right away if you haven't been practicing it but I've been practicing this for 50 years or 60 years so you know maybe by now I should have even caught it before it came out of my mouth but I'm just saying that this practicing will make you very aware of it such that you will hear the Holy Spirit and not silence him as he is trying to work with you at the point of need. And so as we're looking at each of these opportunities to train and we're thinking of where do we go from here, here's what we want to have remembered. We want to have remembered that this is a focus. It is not it is not just something, it is not hard at all. There are not a lot of things I have to learn about getting rid of my humanistic training. If I can look at a focus. Now the same thing is true in choosing curriculum. You see, you've heard me speak to you often about bring Christ into your science, into your math, into your literature and read alouds, into your phonics and into your Bible study. Bring Christ, make him alive and well in each of these studies. And I've given illustration after illustration of how to do that. And I think as I look back on it now, that was all useless. It would be better if I would just share this with you. It's a matter of focus. So when you sit down to teach math and you're wanting to make sure that creation is understood, the power of sovereignty of God, the order and authority of a divine God, all of that is known, that you want to bring your child to know God better day by day and subject by subject. It's just simply going to be your, that your focus is that way. So you might not say anything different, but because you're thinking it, because you're thinking of him, it will ooze out in the way you say other things. And then there will be times when you actually say, wow, we are a privileged body. For as we meet here today in this very, very difficult lesson of grammar, we have none other than the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in his spirit meeting with us. And that's maybe all you will say. Be and that just refreshes the atmosphere to make the student and you know that this difficult lesson is indeed going to be learnable. Is learnable a word? Well, you know what I mean even if it isn't. And so, and so we do that with every subject, all through every day, not monotonously, not he got you, not some kind of anger to win over the stupid student, None of that in attitude, but rather, who is God? How much do I love him? Do my children know who he is? Do they know how much I love him? Do they see him at work? As we look back on yesterday, was there any evidence that he met with us? And so we're constantly talking about him from why? that they may know him. To know him is to love him. To love him is to serve him. And, and so we're, this is what we're building, leadership, from the point of view of knowing him and loving him above all else. And I love you.